Hello, and welcome to the Art of Intuition podcast. My name is Susan Jane, and I believe that trusting your intuition is the best way to live your life with meaning and purpose. Each week you will hear about how you can connect, develop, and trust your intuition through interviews with other guests and my own personal experiences. Join me to understand how your intuition can guide you towards a life full of meaning and loving purpose. Hello and welcome to the Voice of Intuition podcast. I'm Susan Jane, your host for the podcast today. And we have got someone very exciting today. Now, Laquita has just written a book. So I do want to actually go through the book with her. Now, you know me, I, I don't tend to do things like that. If people have got books, it might not be relevant to where, where we're going and what, what we want to get out of it. But Laquita's book is because it's about these um, eight mindset, the growth mindset. I, I can't remember the name of it. Redefining success is the name of it. That's right. We're going to talk about that because I feel that when we, we look at success and the understanding of what success is, we, we do need to redefine it. it we, it's really, really important. So I'm, I'm going to love this interview. This is going to be really fantastic. Um, so stay tuned. If you want to get an understanding of what success is all about, um, Laquita is going to uh, help us. So I want to introduce you to Laquita on the show. Hi, Laquita. Hi, how are you? It's good to Hi. be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you on board. Um, now, you have got quite a story in your background about travel and movement and um, understanding what life is all about. I have not done a bio intro for you or anything like that. <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love you to connect with my audience and, and explain to them a little bit about you and your life. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for that opportunity. So um, my name is Laquita Mondley and I am a wife, mom, grandmother of five and a military spouse. I'm also a minister of the gospel, author and podcaster. Uh, but the thing that brings the most value to my life are my positions as wife, mother and grandmother. And it's through my life's journey that um, I came to realize that those are the things that bring me the most value. And those are the things also that cause me to be able to give um, amazing value uh, to other people. It's been through my journey as a military spouse that I've had an opportunity to live in several places um, around the world, as well as throughout the United States. And so really uh, the book, uh, Redefining Success, and which are eight tools that I've used to develop a growth mindset is a culmination of stories, significant events that have taken place in my life and how I overcame them and sitting, you know, have an opportunity to sit back and be really reflective as to what success means to me, uh, what success means to my marriage, what success means uh, to my husband and I as parents and now as grandparents. And because that definition needs to shift, it's fluid. It, it changes as we change and evolve. And it's also very important that we understand that we alone should be uh, the sole determining factor in what success means uh, to us. So that's just a little bit about me um, and how I came to wanting uh, to write the book and what the book is about. Wow, that's really interesting. And I love how you've said that because success is very fluid. It does mean so many things to different people. Um, too often they determine it with the money and with the, you know, your wealth and whether you're number one on the, the pop stars. Or <laughs> when it isn't really that, is it? You no, know, it's, it's not a feeling. No, it's not, you know. the um, Now, if you would have asked my 17-year-old, 18-year-old self, 21-year-old self, you know, what success meant to me, it would have been evolved around what I now realize is very superficial things, um, mm. money, things, stuff, you know, the, fan, the the nice house, the car, kids going to great schools, living in this great neighborhood, having a great job, career, et cetera. That's where my focus would have been. But where I am right now and what success means to me, not that those things don't bring value because, you know, money makes the world go around. So we have to have money in order to live um, and, and be able to move and do things. But by and large now, 
the success to me is the time, owning my time and being able to spend the time that I want, quality time that I want with my friends, with my family, with my loved ones, doing the things that are passionate to me. And while doing those things that are passionate to me, if I can earn some money along the way, kudos to that. But <laughs> but no longer, right, no longer is it in the reverse, right? Like yes. prior, it, it would have been, let's you know do what we need to do to earn the living because we need to provide for the family. And, you know, sitting where I am now in life, I realized that that's how people face burn, burnout. That's how I faced burnout. That's how I um, ended up in a terrible depression and, and so many other things that, um, yeah, no, not going back that route again. It, you know, it's just, it was the trials of life that led me on the journey to figure out what success means to me. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that, yeah, that's really good. And I mean, the, the fact is that sometimes I, I guess it's really just basic and it's really just there, but we don't look at it, do we? Yeah, we don't, don't question ourselves as to, well, what do you see as success? Mm -hmm. um, I know my partner sort of said to me, he said, um, well, you know, why, why are you doing the podcast? Are you doing it to make money or are you doing it because it's a passion and it's a, and it's a drive mm -hmm. and, and that's where you want to go? Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of going, yeah, that's that's very true. When, when somebody's asked you, then you have to start to look at it in a different way. And yeah. I sort of went, well, no, you don't make money on podcasts. If I get money along the way, then that's a bonus, but yeah. you don't. And I'm not looking at it that way mm -hmm. as you are. You're looking at it to help. It's a passion. It's a drive. And it's so consequently you enjoy it and you succeed at it. Yes. Um, but that's, an, that's enough and that I want to know. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> look at me. Look at me. Um, I want <laughs> I want to know, okay, so we've, we've got an understanding of you. One of the things you didn't say is how how much you have travelled as, as, um, as a military spouse. Before, before we actually started to record this, you said that you had been basically all over the world, you know, everywhere. Now the thought of, you know, some people, they grow up in the same house most of their life the same town they don't sort of go any further yeah. you have just gone from a to b to z to d to f you know all the way to that. <laughs> it was like from a to z just like boom, boom it's like that right <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely and and honestly that takes a lot of doing um and just just for me to look at you as an outsider and go, well, you're successful on being able to move like that. Oh my God, that's, quite, that's so much. So just tell us a little bit more about that movement and and how because the movement can be very disruptive as it, well. It, it it is disruptive. I mean, <laughs> it is honestly. Um, so to tell you about the movement and and how I grew into. Um, learning to be okay with it and developing a rhythm, if you will, with the constant movement. Um, I guess I have to start back with when I met my husband. I met my husband. He was 15. I was 15, excuse me. He was 17. We met in high school. And the rest, as they say, is history. And so upon my graduation from high school, uh, we had already had a child together. So we were teenage parents uh, in high school. But upon my graduation, um, we packed up and my husband was already in the army. He came, picked me up and we went to our first duty station, which was Fort Hood, Texas, 500 miles away from home. I'm 18, he's 20 and we have a one year old and I'm pregnant. Um, and so that was really traumatic. And so the, the first few moves that we had from Texas to Arizona were not like the easiest for me emotionally um, spiritually, financially, it was really, really rough, but due to the nature of his job, we didn't have a choice. Well, I mean, we did have a choice. He could have went and moved from place to place to place, and I could have stayed in one place, but that would have been truly disruptive to the family. So we had to learn how to put our head down and get it done. And, and I say that in it, I, it sounds much easier than it is, but that was, um, those, constant movements did play a role in um, the depression that I was in from a, for a, a very long time. And so, yes, I've lived across the U.S. in several states, Arizona, Texas, Mississippi, um, as well as in Washington State. Um, and then from 
there we've moved overseas and I've lived in the UK and I've lived in Germany, traveled quite a bit across the um, across the UK and Europe, as well as in um, Africa. I've had an opportunity to make several trips to Africa to speak, but just, you know, throughout the UK, France, Germany, Belgium, Turkey, uh, the Netherlands, very beautiful place. One of my favorite places, uh, Spain, excuse me, and um, Switzerland, just uh, lots of different places that we've had an opportunity to, to be, whether we were living, visiting, traveling, or if I was there as a speaker um, or a minister. It's just, I've been fortunate to travel, but the tr movement that we did every two years, um, every two to five years, we would have to move just depending on the situation at the time. The longest we've ever been in any one spot was for seven years. What I really could have moved then, <laughs> I really wanted to move. And we were there for seven years simply because my husband kept going back to Iraq. That was during the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan um, conflicts. And so he was constantly going back and forth to Iraq. So we were stationed in one location at that time. And after he made those uh, three to four trips to Iraq, then we moved to the UK. So it's, it is stressful, but you learn to look at the bright side. You learn to look at the positives and not so much focus on the negatives. And as my children were growing up, because our family was expanding the entire time, as my children were growing, the focus then was how do I keep, how do we keep stability? And how do we help them deal with their transition, losing friends and starting over and you know, I'm the new kid. That's not always the great thing. So our family learned many different little things to um, little tricks, if you will, to help not only me and my husband, but to help our children make it through these transitions. Wow, that's amazing. Because, yeah, it would, that would be so challenging. Um, I We moved. We, we stayed, we, we moved from one side of the town to the other side of the town, we moved onto a, a, a farm and my daughter cracked it so badly that she yeah. decided to walk home. And I said, it's yeah. not our home anymore, you know. That's <laughs> not how it works. <laughs> yeah, my oldest wanted to figure out how to fly back to America because he, he was in the ninth grade um, oh. and he just started dating. And so, of course, you know, they are always oh. in love, aren't they? Yes. We were always in love, and so not we didn't just leave the state; we left the country. And country, he was devastated. I know. Yes, yeah. he was. He was so devastated, and he he volunteered to stay with his grandparents. Let me stay with my aunt. Let me just not leave the country, mom. I'm like, <laughs> mom and dad, can we please just not leave the country? Yeah. And so it it did have its challenges. I mean, looking back at it, if you would, because they're they're adults now, and so they have a different perspective. If you were to ask them, they would definitely tell you both the pros and the cons, but they would also now, they also now appreciate the opportunities that they had to, because it grew them and stretched them and gave them different cultural experiences and Absolutely. made them more rounded individuals. But while they were in it, going through it, I mean, kids are kids. It doesn't matter what their parents do for a living. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, they were having, you know, typical um, growing pains as teenagers. Yeah, I love how you said that too, how you say that, um, you know, when you're going through it, it's really, really challenging. But when you can start to look back at it and you can yes. reflect back, yes. you can start to pick it apart, can't you? You can start to see, okay, yeah, well, that was tough, but yeah. oh, wasn't this good or wasn't that good or <laughs> yeah. And and be, now, you, now you've got um, these all-round um, really uh, well-developed, understood children because it had those experiences. So yeah, as, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. As, as tough as it is, that they're really, really good. That's, yeah. yeah, I love that story. Now, and the other thing you said, Laquita, which we haven't put forward to, uh, as much too, is that you're now a minister as well. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, and it's kind of funny how it happened. <laughs> it's kind of funny how it happened. I grew up in a Christian home, and so you know, like a lot of young people, when I left home, I left. Like it was not my intention to ever step foot in a church again. And it was not because anyone had done anything devastating to me. To be quite honest, I had a pretty sheltered existence being raised in my grandmother's house. I just had to go to church all the time. And 
because of the way that I was raised, there were lots of things that my friends did that I couldn't do and other girls got to do that I just could not do. At this point in life, I thank my grandmother every day for not allowing me to do that because <laughs> it, it, it bore the fruit she was looking for. But I had a lot of anger and resentment in me as a young woman, even as a young wife. And so it was the trials and tribulations of my marriage um, that drove me and my husband back to the way we were raised and what we knew. And it was at that time that we realized, yes, I understood how to go to church. But I did not understand what relationship meant. I did not understand the spirituality aspect of what I thought I believed at the time as a kid. Yeah. And so with that experience, my husband going to Iraq for the very first time, he was there for the initial invasion of Baghdad. It's, it's like, Jesus, if you were real, I need you right now because I have no idea what to do or how to keep it together. And this is not fair. And so that started my relationship with the, with the Lord and started my journey, my Christian journey as an adult. And it was through this, through me evolving and maturing in that spiritual relationship and learning how to connect and understanding who I am and who Christ is to me and sharing that with the, um, with the women in my circle of the military other um, military spouses that lived around me and that I would bump into in the shopping center because we were all going through that same trauma. All of our spouses were away at war and we were here trying to keep it together. And yeah. that kind of just it unintentionally developed into me becoming a minister of the gospel. It wasn't anything that I sought after I was just seeking to be able to help someone the way that other women had been helping me in my in my time of trouble. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. And and it's it's so we we go in so many different ways, you know. And and one of the things that I, I always talk about is that what suits you may not suit the next person, and what suits me may not suit you. And mm -hmm. and we need to find those paths and those directions. And you found yours in in that way, and and that's. Yes brilliant but i think we've we've, we've talked about it long enough we've, i want to know i want to know <laughs> now first of all i'm going to put the little banner up so here's the little banner now this for the people on the podcast that don't see the little banner this is uh, Laquita's book, and it's called Redefining Success, yes. Eight Tools to a Growth Mindset. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, we're going to just brief, and, and we're not giving away all um, Laquita's IP, like in, in <laughs> your property here. Um, you've got to buy the book for all that. But we want to brush over those eight tools because they might resonate with people, and we could yes. get a deeper understanding of it then. So yes. let's start. What is, do we start at number one, or do do, you know, do you follow these tools in an order or can we just grab a tool wherever we want to? We can just grab a tool um, wherever we would want to. And there is not um, a particular order, uh, as it okay. were. It's not a particular order. It was the, the story is written in kind of the order of the events as they happen. But yes. the tools themselves, um, there's not an order. So I, I would like to start with um, call to connect um, and call to connect is that really focuses on your identity. Do we understand who we are? And at, a, at 25 years old, I realized I had absolutely no idea who I was and I had absolutely no idea why I was placed on the earth what it what is that I'm supposed to be doing. Have, have you guys ever met someone who, you know, this week they're doing A, B, and C, and the next week they're doing E, F, and G. And, you know, it's like they're all over the place, all of the time, always starting in something, but never quite finishing it. Yes, and that's better than me. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been me in back in those days. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> It was definitely me. It was, it was definitely me. And it was because I had no idea who I was yes. and what I was called to do. The And because I did not understand who I am and what my purpose in the earth was, I was devaluing the thing that I was called to do. So 
in the beginning, I, I introduced myself as being a wife, mom, and grandmother. And I did that on purpose. And I talk about it in this particular chapter. And the main reason that I do that is because for so long in my life, prior to understanding the purpose and plan that God had for my life, I absolutely devalued my position as wife, mother. And now that I'm a grandmother, that's the best thing since sliced bread. But oh, at that time, right. <laughs> it was, you know, the, the, the role as wife and mom, I had allowed outside influences to determine the value that I placed on those positions. And that value was zero, little to no value at all. Um, and I saw myself as worthless and not being one that has been contributing. And because society um, at that time, um, it was, yes, it, it was a time where women as women, we were getting our voice, gaining momentum in the workforce, gaining momentum, breaking through glass ceilings. And all of that is wonderful. If that is your choice, that does not mean that if you elect to be a stay at home mom or if you are in a position right now where you have to be a stay at home mom because it's just more economically feasible for the family. That does not mean that you do not have value and worth in what you're doing. That means that you can what it truly means is you can never be fully compensated for the work that you're doing and you're doing a valuable work. That wasn't my perspective at that time. Yes. And so just looking at those outside influences, I felt like because the I was choosing at that moment to be a stay at home mom because it was financially feasible. We had five little ones. That's a lot of daycare. So it was, that's a lot of daycare. <laughs> and in those days, they didn't have daycare. Not like they do now. There was no such thing as 24-hour daycare, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> so, there, there just wasn't the option to do that a lot of the time. All the time. And because I did not live in my hometown, I could not take them to my parents. I could not mm. take them to my husband's parents or their aunts or their uncles, you know, cousins. I couldn't pay a cousin to come and babysit. We were yes. in a city all to ourselves. And so, and my emotions, you know, I, I allow the negative thought and, and the negative talk to overwhelm me and be, and shaped that definition of myself. And so I devalued it. So I was out doing all of these many different things, trying to prove that I was worthy, trying yes. to prove to myself and to other people that I had value to bring outside of just being a baby making factory or being a housekeeper or the cook or, you know, all of those things that I felt like, you know, this is all that I can do. So in that chapter, I really began to unpack those thoughts, those feelings and, and talk about, you know, the negative self images and the negative self talk and some things that we can do to overcome that in looking at who you are right now. And the thing that you're doing right now that you may feel is worthless is priceless to someone else. It's priceless to your family. You know, it's it's priceless to the life or, or the children that you're raising. If it, if that is the case that you are that stay at home mom, and if you're happy with it, don't let anyone else tell you that it's worthless. You continue to be happy with what you're doing, and you don't have to go out and be the working mom if that's not what you want to be or be the entrepreneur and if you are the woman that wants to be the entrepreneur and wants to be the working home mom do not let anyone who feels like women should not work outside of the home don't let them define that for you yes that, that is not what success means to you what success means to you is working outside of the home because that's how you feel valuable that's your ideal that's your dream sis go out be go forth and be great do that do that yes. thing and be the best at it. If you're a sister that says, okay, I don't want to have children, right? Like, I don't want to have children. I want to focus on my success. If that's where you are in your life and you and your partner have come into an agreement with them and that's what you want to do, then by all means do that. The, the book by and large is all about a journey of self-discovery and different tools that I've learned along the way to help craft Laquita. And that I've used those tools to help other people uh, figure out their blueprint of life, who I and who they are and what they're called to do. And in that chapter, we begin to unpack that of understanding what we're called to do. And in this chapter, I realized what I am called to do 
and that I'm, and one of those things is to be a people connector. And one of the other um, chapters in the book is called um, uh, self innovation. And in this uh, particular chapter of self innovation, we're really beginning to look at what do I need to do to start to cultivate my future self. And that's not so much an action, a physical action, as it is a mental exercise. Yes. I have to mentally see myself the way that I want to be. I have to see my future self in my mind's eye right now and own her. This is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm called to do. This is me. It doesn't matter where you are right now, physically, naturally. Where are you at in your mental state? And the 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 biggest battlefield in that, and the thing that we have to overcome is that our, our mental state of being, you know, our, our emotional health, our spiritual health in that aspect. And crafting out who my future self is, it's a mental exercise. And when I'm healthy and I'm successful in that mental exercise, it begins to get easier to journal that out. Then it begins to get easier to walk out the things that I've journaled out, if you will, if that, if that makes sense. Yes. Oh, that is that is really nice. I love that, that call to connect because that was one of the first areas that I started to look. I, I call it my research area because I had to research who I was and, and what it was all about. And and you can't, I mean, well, you can Google yourself now, but you couldn't in those days. <laughs> not in those days, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so not I, in the, yeah, not in the, in the early, well, the early 90s for me, yeah. you know, in the early 90s, no. Yeah. And there, if you was could, no. Google, by, by the time you connected <laughs> to the internet, you just, you <laughs> forgot what you wanted. <laughs> By then you'd spent all your money anyway, hadn't you? Yes. <laughs> so I so I was doing it through um, books, and I, I'm mm -hmm. a theory tester, Laquita. I, I like to test theories. So when I get your book, I'm going to be going through and testing all those theories. But already, what you've said, I've, I've already awesome. tested all them anyway. So <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking your book's good. It's, it's working. <laughs> um, but I I had to go through and and I would get like ten books at a time, like self help mm -hmm. books at a time, just to get an understanding. And I would take out of those books, and and you can do this with Laquita's book. Mm -hmm. Take out of those books what resonates with you yes because when we don't we don't write these books I mean you know we don't put these books down or we don't take them for them to be consumed and you have to do everything that way right um, and and I'm sure the way you have just talked about that call to connect the way you have written that book is here's an idea here's a tool take it on board if you want to twist exactly. it around if it suits you but exactly. take, yeah, get an understanding of it, test it, see if it's going to work for you. And, and that's what I really like. That was, that's really, that's really cool. Now the self-innovation again is then you're starting to look at going forward and where yeah. you want to be going forward. Yeah. Now I call this, this is what I like about it. It's the same stuff that I do. We just use different names for it. And so people will resonate with the names that you've used, which, which yes. is really lovely. Yes, so the yes. self-innovation is where you're actually creating the new future you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and, and I, I call that visualisation, but it's it's the same stuff. It's just, I actually like your words better. I think self-innovation <laughs> is gorgeous. I mean, it's really lovely. Um, <laughs> Thank you. You know, the biggest tool takeaway in self-innovation, the second tool takeaway that I would say um, that I want the reader to focus at is giving themselves grace. Yes. It's, it's giving yourself grace, giving yourself. It's like a little one learning to rock, to walk for the first time or learning to ride a bike for the first time. They want mm -hmm. to do it and they want it now. Yes. But every time they fall, they cry and they bounce up like a little jack in the box and they go for it again. Yeah. As adults, we tend to fall and linger. You know, if we just well, think for a minute, right? <laughs> and we're angry because it didn't work. Yeah. Children give themselves so much grace. Yeah. They really do. It's I don't even know if they think about the failure the way that we do. We do. 
I don't even think that they see it as a failure. It's okay. I got to try again. Yeah. Give yourself grace in this process, in the entire process that you're going to go through when you're redefining success as it suits you right now at this time in your life. Mm -hmm. It's not an overnight thing. It's not a, okay, in a week, it's done. You know, I'm not the type of author or coach that tells you if you follow all of the steps to my framework in 90 days, you'll be a new and perfect you. Yes. I mean, I, I would love that. <laughs> I would love that. And for clients that, that, that I work with, if that happens, wonderful. Mm. But everybody's story and everybody's process and the way that they process is different. And so the results will differ on how people are able to shift through the different processes, right? Yes. And this is the one, this is the process, part of the process where I absolutely uh, need my clients and really want the reader to take away in this process of creating your future self. Give yourself grace. Mm. Mm. And and the part of the falling down is the learning. If we don't fall down, we don't learn. We don't learn. We, we've got to get that understanding. It's just we want to try and cushion that fall a little bit if we can. If we can, <laughs> right? If we can, we, we yeah, cushion yeah. it a little bit. And 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 those that are ready to take this type of journey, yeah, the cushion, the cushion is there. Yes. Yeah. The cushion is there because the, it's the willingness to try. It's the willingness to explore. Individuals that are stuck in fear, they hate where they are, but they're so afraid of the failure, if you if I can say it like that, or they're so afraid of the unknown that they will remain in their stuckness and they will remain in dissatisfaction and bitterness and anger. They will remain unsatisfied with their needs not being met because they learn how to operate and maneuver in that versus stepping outside of that and going to pursue their future self, figure out who they are. What do I want to be? What do I want to do? Let me explore the world around me. That mm -hmm. takes a great deal of courage. And it's that willingness to try and that courage that's going to be the cushion if you should fail but then how do you determine what failure means in this yeah. process i really like for uh, my clients and i'm and i'm mentioning in the book to redefine what failure means mm. redefine it like one of my mentor and, and coach uh, as a john maxwell certified coach one of the things that and it's a book that john wrote as well, and it's a term he uses, falling forward. Yes. If I'm falling forward, my momentum is still pushing me forward, right? So Sweet. I can still keep moving forward. Yes. Yeah. And just look at it as, as that falling forward or failing forward. Yeah, it might not have worked, but I have one more step forward. Absolutely. And you know... And you've got and you've got one way you've learned another way of how not to do it as well. Exactly. Then you know, there's, there's success in the trying. It doesn't matter how the, what the outcome was. The success is in the trying. Yes, it's absolutely, absolutely in the trying. Yeah, and it get, that gives us our strength and our our um, momentum, as you say, to keep going yeah. forward. Keep yeah. Going forward. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, Laquita, we've got time for one more, only okay. one more. Okay, so okay. Okay. one more tool to help me to redefine success. So another tool would be rethinking obstacles, rethinking oh. obstacles. And it, it again, it does, it, this chapter, uh, in this chapter, I talk about the way that we look at adversities. Are we looking at adversities from completely negative lenses or are we looking at adversities as opportunities? And many of the things that we enjoy in life today, they were developed and created out of a need, out of someone, some adverse situation. And now because someone was creative enough to take that adverse situation and find an opportunity in it. Now that changed their life and the lives of those that, that are now benefiting from the product or service. 
as horrible as COVID was to the world, as destructive as it was to the world, to the economy, to just everything that makes our world spin, there was a lot of great things birthed out of the pandemic. And a lot of people discovered who they were, what they wanted to do. They took control of their, their finances. They started businesses. They left jobs that they hated, started companies that are thriving and they're passionate and love what they're doing. So how do we look at adversities? Mm-hmm. When we sh- change the way that we think, and we began to see what we want. So in this, I, I talk about a process that I call the process of change. Things say do. In the midst of these adversities, what are we thinking? What are we saying? Because what we're thinking, we're going to say. What we say, we're going to do. And what we do determines who we are. Yes. So in the midst of our adversities, what? how do we think about them? What is it that we're doing? Because if we, if our thought pattern is, if we're allowing our emotions to control our thought pattern, then we're likely to have reactions and responses that will make that adverse situation worse. Example, grease fire in your kitchen. Don't throw water on it. Mm-hmm. You throw water on it, you're going to burn your kitchen down. Yeah. Grease fire in my kitchen. And I did not allow panic and fear to cause me to react. I smother that fire. I may have to throw that pot out, but I still have my kitchen intact. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we look at how do we think in this chapter? What are we saying? What are we doing? How to take and look at um, any adverse situation that you may be going through and find an opportunity in it. You might not find that opportunity in the midst of going through it. Let's just be clear. Like, we're not robots. You might not find, you might not find that opportunity right then and there. Yeah. But yeah. as we're processing through that, after mm. you've overcome that adversity and you're able to look back at it and, t- and, and pull it apart and find the opportunity for growth in it, find the opportunity to, to take something um, that you've learned as you're overcoming that adverse situation and how to make that tool benefit you, how to make it multiply for you personally, professionally, spiritually, emotionally in the midst of these situations, because we overcome them, then that means we're greater than the situation. So what are my takeaways out of there that can be a blessing to me as well as a blessing to other people? Yes. And the, and the other aspect to that, I mean, we might be going through an adverse adversary now, Mm -hmm. But and and we might not be able to reflect on it because mm-hmm. it's it's happening. It's in our it's face. happening, right? <laughs> yeah. But is there one that you've already been through? Is this a cycle? Have you already gone through something similar yes. that you can reflect yes. back on that yes. and get an understanding of what's happening now? Now, yes. You know, that, and that and that. So, am I looking at this adversary? I'm having trouble saying that. Um, it's too early in the morning for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> am I looking at it the same way I did a prior one? And mm. it might be something completely different, but we do tend to look at these hiccups and these hurdles and these obstacles the same way. If we yeah. if we tend to look at them and, and attack them or look at them negatively, we're going to always do that. Whereas mm. if we start to go, hang on, all right, I looked at it that way last time. Let me look at it a different way. See if mm. I can do it this way. And, and it's and I love that. So re, just rethinking those obstacles yeah. because, yeah, it's it's not, it, it is in our, in our mindset. It is, yeah. yes, things, things are happening. I, I agree with that. But things are happening for a reason. For a reason, yeah. Yeah, and if you just let it happen without questioning a mm-hmm. question, that, that's a new word I've just made up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We we it, we it just keeps going. It just keeps repeating. We need to stop it and question it and go. Okay, yep, all right. Even if we still do the same thing, mm-hmm. that question has put, I don't know, a, a different slant on that obstacle, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. It has. You know, even if it's that question is, is it really that bad? Is it really that big? 
is that obstacle really that important? And, you know, yeah. you're just putting a different slant on it, aren't you? So, you, you know, each time you, each time you question an obstacle that comes through, each time you rethink it, like you say, mm -hmm. it's changing it and it's, it's changing. changing the way mm -hmm. you automatically process it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that yeah. is cool. The victory is in the mindset. Let's out. The victory is in the mindset. And absolutely. when, when your mindset shifts, it, the things that we, we meditate on are the things that we're going to become yes. because the things that, again, that we become and how we're able to process through um, adversities, how we're able to process through um, successes, because sometimes past successes can keep us so stuck that we can't get a future success. So yeah. learning how to process through those things and the way that we think and the way that we're able to move forward and the things that we're the things that we say consistently uh, determines the path that we're taking and so we have to get that victory in our mindset that's the uh, that's again that's one of the biggest tools biggest keys um to whatever you have determined success to be for you you're gonna have to get control of your mindset and and learn that our emotions are indicators they don't rule over us and they we should not make decisions based off of those emotions. Likewise, we're not stone walls. We're not brick walls. We don't ignore the emotions. Pay attention to the emotions. They're there for a reason. Yes. But process through, as, as, as you said, process through that and then step back and try to make a decision after you process through those emotions, after you process through the events um, that you're dealing with and then make a logical decision. Yes, uh, that yeah, that is gold. It, because um, emotions, yeah, like you say, they are there and and they're important. They're but very important. Just, yeah, but we just don't have to. I I don't know about you. I look at it this way. So emotions, I see as the external expression, mm. and feelings are what we're feeling inside, and we can we can uh, absorb them and, and understand them. We don't have to always externally express them. So right. when you start to get these feelings, you sort of go acknowledge it and go, yeah, okay, I'm getting mm -hmm. these feelings. There's a reason why. Mm -hmm. Do we have to act it out? Do we have to express that it? That part. That and, part. Yeah. And that's that connection if we can, we can not necessarily sever that, but get that understanding of it and then we, we're going to express it correctly or correctly. In, a, in a better way, yeah. 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 I like to say that really it's very much what you just said. Our emotions are indicators. They're yes. indicators to us. Something's yeah. going not right. Something's going good. Something is eh, kind of shaky. Let's take a look at that thing. <laughs> but they're indicators, right? Like when you get a fever, the fever is an indicator that something's not right. Well, we don't just take, take ourselves and, you know, oh, I've got a fever. Let me go fill my tub full of 10 pounds of ice and get in it. Mm -hmm. That's not quite no, the answer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. We go yeah. to search through what is causing the fever and then let me deal with those things so that the fever can subside. Yeah. Yeah. So indicators. Oh, indicators. That's amazing. What's causing me to feel this way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, before we go any further, because we, we, we will have to wrap it up soon, I do okay. want to let people know because the video, they can see your uh, website down the bottom. But, of course, our podcast listeners can't see the website at the bottom. Um, and I would like you to tell people the website, please, because you will yes. spell it out and say it properly. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> please visit me at my website at www dot laquita monley.com that's www l a q u i t a m o n l e y dot com laquita mon www dot laquita monley dot com see i knew you'd do it better than me <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, this was really lovely yeah, make sure you jump on the website and have a look at her book it's redefining success eight tools to a growth mindset by laquita monley um it, it's yeah I, i'm we've only heard three of them so you can imagine and they were just gold you can imagine what the others are going to be like so yeah it's, it's a it's a great book have a look at it 
Um, and I want to thank you so much. Have you got any passing um, guidance, information, anything you want to put forward before we go? Um, just first, I'll, again, I'd like to thank you so much for allowing me um, to come onto your podcast today and just have this amazing conversation and talk about myself and my book and some of the things that we do. Um, and the, the thing that I would love to leave with the audience again is to um, follow me on social. If you want to have a chat with me, I'm pretty active on social media. If you Google Laquita Modeling, you'll find all things Laquita Modeling. I'm really active on LinkedIn and Instagram. I am on Facebook as well, um, YouTube and Twitter. So if you want to have a chat, message me on the one of the social media platforms and I do respond quickly. If you want to um, have, a, have a chat with me about anything, you know, business related, whether it's coming on your podcast or speaking or et cetera, et cetera, you can fill out the contact us form on the website and I'll be happy to have a conversation with you. Ah, oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much for being on the show, Equator. You are welcome. Thank you for having me. It has been super fabulous. Oh, no, it's been our pleasure, I can assure you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So, guys, jump on. Um, and, and I did forget to say at the beginning, you know, like, subscribe, share. Uh, but after you're hearing that interview, I mean, it, it's not hard to share that and get that understanding and information, especially if you've got a friend or somebody that you know that really could just do with that little bit of a helping hand. And they may get that understanding by hearing it from somebody else. Um, that's one of the big things that I, I, I like to put forward to people because sometimes when we hear it from another person, it, it sort of starts to make sense. And often we need to hear it three times before we actually act on it or do something about it. So share, like, subscribe, the uh, the voice of intuition. You can contact me on intuitivenature.com.au. It's Australian business. So, uh, and uh, connect with me that way or on the socials too. But in the description, you'll find Laquita's details and you'll be able to connect with her that way. So I am saying bye for now. Uh, have a great week and um, we'll see you next week. Okay. Oh, hang on. I've got to press the right buttons here. Oh, right button. Yeah. Okay. See you guys. <laughs>